We're in Titus. We're going to be in Titus for the rest of this month, except for the last week when Advent series season starts. And I'm excited about that. Uh, we are going to take a, a different sort of approach to uh, looking at the, the Christmas story this year. Um, I'm going to, to preach part of that. Scott McClure is going to preach a message, and Tony Postaway is going to join us as we look at uh, the gifts that are given to us through our King. And I pray that you will be inviting friends and family members to join you, especially friends and family members who need to hear the gospel, who need to know that there's a God that loves them and loved them enough to send their son to, his son to redeem them. And during the month of December, it's going to be gospel, gospel heavy. So please be thinking, be praying about who you can invite I also want to encourage you to take advantage of our Wednesday night uh, series during November. Jeremiah and Lindsay Kuhn, they kicked off last Wednesday a, a workshop, and there's two more weeks to it, on how to share your faith uh, with somebody, to how, what steps you go through, and to tell your story and what God has done through Jesus in your life. So please don't, please don't miss out on that. It's a valuable tool for you. Um, and the first week was, was awesome. It's at 6, uh, we'll call it 6.05 in the traditional sanctuary. Uh, it gives you time to drop your kids off at, at uh, either a Team Kid uh, or upstairs in for middle school ministry before heading over and joining Jeremiah and Lindsay in that study. Please don't miss it. It's a, it's a valuable resource for you. So we have been in Titus for several weeks, and we're looking at Titus and one of the main themes in the book of Titus, in the letter that, Titus, uh, that we have of Titus, is that he is concerned about godly living, both individually for the Christian and corporately for the bride of Christ, the church. And everything in that points to that. And how are you, church, willing to set aside everything that hinders you from living a godly life in full view of everybody around you in the midst of a culture uh, where maybe anything goes? So, so we spent some time looking uh, at, uh, at, at how this letter, where it's coming from, who it's to, and the power that it had, uh, and the power that the gospel had. Uh, at the beginning of this, this series, we also shared uh, a quote and it was from a, a commentator, his last name is Demarest, and he said this. He said, doctrine becomes deadly when it is divorced from godly living. Truth must produce goodness or it's no truth at all. And I think that's something that we see in Scripture. We see it in the book of James. We see it in this letter uh, called Titus. And uh, I, I hope that that's what we're leaning into that individually as believers and corporately as this local church, we desire to live godly lives and back that up in the way that we live. Other way, we're not, we're not proclaiming truth, or otherwise we're not proclaiming truth at all. I, I like to read old stuff, and I shared some of that with you last week, that I like to read the prayer of dead dudes, um, and, and it's just how they speak to me even centuries later. But I also like to read old commentaries. So, so anytime I pick up a new commentary or a new book, I like to take that current one and compare it against the classic one, or at least have them compare to be able to contrast the two. And, I, and one that I really like to use is the Interpreter's Bible Commentary. And this was written in 1955. And if we were able to change just a few words, a few of the isms uh, to, to more currently fit 2021, Man, there's some powerful stuff in this commentary. So instead of me re trying to recreate it, let's just see, uh, let's just listen to uh, what the interpreter's Bible commentary said about this section of the book of Titus from 1955. One of the reasons why the writer of this letter was so deeply concerned with the character of the church officers is that Christianity was fighting for its life against the Gnostic heresy. It had to demonstrate its power to produce better men and women. Again, in the 20th century, the Christian church is confronted with powerful and persuasive competitors. Nazism, communism, secularism, materialism, and a whole gamut of enthusiastic cults, many of them embodying the same features of first century Gnosticism, challenging Christianity's claim to men's allegiance. These challenges cannot be ignored or taken lightly. Christians believe in the ultimate triumph of God, but the work of the church may be set back for centuries, and millions of people never know the blessings of the gospel if the church in this generation 
fails to meet the challenges with which it is confronted. The Christian church must outthink, outserve, and outevangelize its competitors. And it can do so only as its adherents demonstrate the capacity to outlive and, if need be, outsuffer the adherents to rival religions. Hence the necessity for outstanding Christian character in the church's leaders and its members. Now, take out a few or switch out a few of those isms uh, for something more current. That's still a very powerful commentary on why the church needs godly men and women leading and serving in her ranks. The church is better. The church has to be better. It has to be more compassionate. It has to be more committed and and more uh, intentional and more focused and frequent in proclaiming her message than whatever culture or whatever rival religion is uh, promoting. And that's exactly what Paul is getting at in these verses. So far in this, we've looked at who Paul is. We know who Paul is. We know the story of how Jesus got his attention. I literally blinded by the light of God, changed his life forever and the course of of Christianity forever. So we learned who he was, that he was very passionate about the local churches on the island of Crete. And we learned who Titus was, that he wasn't just some random guy picked up and plopped on Crete. He was was a church changer. He was somebody who went into hard places and helped set straight the church uh, in, in that place. And we learned, we learned what Crete was like, that it was an anything-go type of society and culture, but we also saw the power that the Word of God had on that anything-go society, where, where Christianity once was a side bet, then ruled the day. It transformed the island. And here in verse 5, we continue with how Paul tells Timoth- or Titus to set straight things on the island things in the church. So we've read five before. We're going to read it again, but we're going to continue reading through the end of this section down through verse number nine. So if you have your Bible, I encourage you to to read. The words will be on the screen as well. This is from the ESV, the English Standard Version. Paul says, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. These are Paul's words to Titus when he says, put what remained in order. And do that in part by appointing elders. And notice what he says right after that. Or notice more, maybe importantly, what he doesn't say. He doesn't say that to appoint elders and then give a list that, that includes their, their resume. Their leadership resume that says they transform this city and this city or this organization and this organization. He didn't go immediately to their skill set and say, hey, choose this guy, this type of guy, because he's a successful business owner or he's a successful community organizer. He didn't do that. He didn't elevate the skill set above what he does elevate. He didn't start with their their educational uh, um, standing either. He has, a, he has a bachelor's degree. He has a master's degree. He has a doctorate degree. He has an honorary, this or that degree. He doesn't start with the educational standing either. He doesn't start with the list of awards that have been heaped on to a person. No. Instead, he starts with the character and integrity of a leader. Now, these other characteristics um, are, are, are important. Uh, You need to be a leader of some type, and all of us, if we really think of it, are a leader in the realm in which we have been placed by God. And these are while these are directed specifically to elders, if we were to go over into the rest of Titus, two chapters two and three, we'll see that these same words are used to describe church members. 
of every generation. And we can go all through Matthew through Revelation and see a time and time again where these same attributes, these same characteristics are applied to somebody who is a believer. So today, as we look at this, we want to look at things through two different lenses. All of us are going to use this section of Scripture as a mirror to look into it and see if this is our mirror uh, Titus 1, 5 through 9, if this is our mirror, how do we match up? Do we reflect what we see here? All of us, church, this morning, looking into the mirror. Now, if you're a leader in the church, if you are a, on staff, if you are working our children's ministry, if, you, if you're a deacon, if you are shepherding this church in any way, I want you to also look through another lens this morning. I want you to look through the lens of a microscope. And if this is our microscope, this section of Scripture, when you see these characteristics, when you see the characteristics of your life magnified, is this what you see? Because this is what Paul says, and other New Testament writers say, this is what you should look like as a Christian follower, as a member of the local church, and as a leader in the local church. So today this section of scripture through those lenses into mirrors and into microscopes. First Peter chapter two, Paul calls us out. And just like the, the, you know, the Israelites in the Old Testament were called out, Paul calls us out. And that's where we get our marching orders from. Because in this church, we believe that what Peter said in first Peter uh, is it, true. When he, when he said something like this, as you, could, as you come to him, as you come to Jesus, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. If you skip down to a few verses, he continues that same thought. He says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That sound familiar? Sound like something that Pastor Scott may have shared with you a few weeks back from the book of Hosea. He's saying, once you, once you didn't have a name, I've named you. Once you weren't a people, I chose you. Once you didn't have a future, now you have a future. No mercy, now my mercy is lavished on you. Because we believe Scripture, all of us were called into a priesthood of believers, meaning that we all share our, our, goal, our, our collective passions and interests and giftedness for the good of the kingdom, for the good of the body. All of us, church, are leaders. And as image bearers of Jesus, we should desire for these characteristics to be prevalent in our lives. When you go and look at this section of Scripture and go look at the other pastors and commentators, they, they break this down into different, different ways or different lists. So for example, one list that comes from David Platt, Daniel Aiken, and Tony Morita's Christ-Centered Exposition Commentary, um, he, they say that leaders and Christians uh, sh must be people with godly commitments, of godly character, of godly conduct, and of godly, or with godly convictions. They broke it down into four. That, that same commentary that I read from before says the essentials here seem to be that the leader should be blameless in family life, self-controlled, and he should be able to accept and teach sound doctrine. Well, I like those. And for our place, for our time, for FBCW and the communities that we live and love and serve, and for this time in 2021, I would like to look at this in three different realms for us. Three different realms in which believers and Christian leaders should be blameless. But before we get into that, I think we need to level the playing field a little bit, create a little bit of common ground. Because sometimes when we come to Scripture, when we read it in our English Bibles, uh, sometimes we immediately take the English meaning of something and throw it on that without going back and seeing what the original people heard or understood. 
Okay? You two young ladies up front, that should be familiar to you. Go back. It cannot mean for us what it didn't mean for the original readers or hearers. So we need to go back. I am not a Greek or Bible language expert. I know enough to hurt myself. But many years ago, somebody invented uh, the, uh, the internet and put some pretty cool tools on there. And there's several on there, and one of them is called stepbible.org, S-T-E-P, Bible.org. You can go to it, and you can pull up any section of Scripture in almost any translation of the Bible that you would want to. And what I like about this is you can just take the, the, the cursor and hover over a word or phrase, and it will, without doing anything, it'll give you a little bit more meaning. Or you can click on it, and off to the side, it pops up all kinds of stuff. Well, if you were to use Bible step for this word, um, rep- uh, must be above reproach or blameless, it would tell you that those words, regardless of how it's translated into English, comes from the weak word, the, the weak word, the Greek word. I have trouble with English, so you can imagine how much trouble I have with Greek. All right? It comes from the Greek word, um, a name kletos, and it means not perfect. It means not holy, not completely righteous. It means absence or free from accusation. It's sort of the word that they use for David. Now, was David blameless? Absolutely not. We could do a a year's worth of sermons on the shortcomings of David. But how is he referred to? As a man after God's own heart. And that's what, that's, what this, this what's, that's what this word circles back to. That he's, they were blameless, that we're chasing after a different standard. That in these areas of my life, nobody can accuse me of going against the grain all the time. Uh, uh, of being oppositional uh, to what God is teaching. Free from accusation. Can I be perfect? Man, if you give me an empty room with nothing in it and a stopwatch that goes to about four seconds, I might be able to fill that gap with perfection. But outside of that, no. And you guys aren't either. None of us are perfect. But we should strive to be free from accusation of things that fly in the face of God. So with that in mind, Christian leaders... Christians should be blameless, should be free from accusation in three different realms. The first of those is we must be blameless in the home. Notice what he starts off with. Notice what he, an an elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife. He he must be a man whose children believe uh, and, and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. That's what he's saying. Now, I, I, I try to say this regularly, but this week, please, if you want me to get down on a knee, I will. Please use the one sheet because what we are covering here quickly really needs to be dug down deep into. And in 2022, we, uh, sometime in that year, we will circle back around and visit these same characteristics when we look in First and Second Timothy, and we'll look at more in detail. But for now, please do the heavy work. Please take the time to go and to spend time in Scripture and to look at each of these as you look into the mirror of Scripture. How do you, how well do you resemble these characteristics? How well, how, if you're married, how is that relationship with your spouse? If you're a parent, are you training up your children in the, the admonition of the Lord? Right? What do these phrases, what do these words mean and what do they do? What don't they mean? Because sometimes we try to take, take something and, and force it in here, and that's not really what was intended. So spend time this week looking at uh, what each of these words mean, these characteristics. Some of them phrased positively, some of them phrased in sort of a negative light. But how well are you uh, reflecting these characteristics in your life? Why might Paul start with the family? Why must he say you must be blameless when it comes to the home or in the home? Because he refers to, in in some translations, the church as God's household. And how a man, how a leader leads in the home is going to be a reflection of how he will lead in the church. If he is domineering at home, he's going to be a bully in the church. If he lacks responsibility in the home, he's going to let things slip in the church. 
A, a leader, a Christian, must be blameless at home. Paul starts here. He says the most important reference that a church can use when, this, when choosing leaders is to look at his home life. The second area, the second realm in which, a, in which a Christian, in which a Christian leader should be blameless is he should be blameless in character. And Paul, again in verse 7, he uses that word blameless or above reproach, but this time he's talking about a, this all-around character, not just in, in one aspect, but all around. And he lists five negative characteristics and six positives. Okay? Spend some time looking at these. Be honest with yourself. You can't be honest with a spouse or with your children unless you're honest with yourself. Spend some time with these. How do you measure up the five negative characteristics that that should be avoided in in leaders and Christians is not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. And then he flips the table and takes a positive approach to it. In verse number eight, he says, look for people who are hospitable, who are one, one who loves what is good, one who is self-controlled, who is upright, who is holy, who is disciplined. Now, before you say, I can never be this, make sure you go back and you look at what the word means and what it doesn't mean. How well are you imaging these characteristics? And please spend some time in scripture and in prayer this week. Remember, Paul's primary concern here is not finding people with the best skills. His primary concern is with character. He, and there's two reasons for this. Right? First of all, skills used for a selfish end become destructive. Uh, right now, as soon as I said that, you had images of people who fit that example come to your head. People who are immensely talented but because they did not use their talents for the wrong reason, brought on destruction rather than healing, rather than progress. Skills used for selfish ends become destructive. You can see this all throughout history, can't you? Tyrants who did evil, and they didn't get there by accident. They got there because they were equipped with a lot of characteristics that sometimes we think are admirable, but because their character was out of whack. Their skills led them down a deep path, or a dark path. The second, uh, uh, that a failure to teach truth often results, often starts with a failure to live morally. If a leader isn't living the right way, he's not going to be willing to teach the right way. I I, I want to be the, the most transparent leader that I possibly can. But... Uh, it, It's true for me. Isn't it true for you that there's things that we suffer with, there's things that we struggle with, are the things that we don't like to talk about very much? So if I am not honest, if I am not a godly pastor, FBCW is going to miss out on a lot of truth because I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to face that head on. Faulty desire soon leads to faulty teaching. We see this warning in 1 Timothy chapter 6. And leaders in the church, plurality of uh, godly men, uh, the, the, the incorporation of godly Christians keep us from chasing after just the newest thing, the shiniest thing to the detriment of truth. And you may say that this doesn't apply to you, but I want you to be honest this morning. I want you to be honest with yourself. Are there behaviors that you know in your life that are sinful, but you find it easy to excuse them or belittle them so that you can pretend that there's nothing wrong, that everything's fine? You just sort of scoot them behind you and you don't want to deal with them. Or you go into the comparison game that at least I'm not this person or at least I'm better here. Aren't there things in all of our lives where we sort of excuse um, because in the grand scheme of things, I'm a pretty good person. But we find that those little things, when given a hold, are going to lead you, are going to grow, and are going to transform you in a bad way, away from what God intends for you. Blameless in home, blameless in character, and in the third section, or the third area in which we must strive to be blameless, is blameless in doctrine. He says in verse number nine, he says, hold firm, hold firmly to the trustworthy message as has been taught. 
so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Leaders, elders specifically here, must have the ability to encourage and refute or rebuke. And we're going to see why next week, why leaders in the church and, and sort of guilty by association or lumped in because we are believers, all of us need to be ready to encourage and rebuke because there's a lot at stake. And we're going to take a deep look at that next, next week as we continue through this first chapter. This is, what, this is a key way that elders manage God's household, that leaders manage, that, that shepherds and pastors manage. They, they hold firm to the trustworthy message. Well, what is this trustworthy message? For the church, that trustworthy message is always the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we have two pictures of that in this letter uh, that Titus received. And we see one in chapter 2 and one in chapter 3. That one in chapter 3, I just want you to pay attention as we read through it because you can see yourself uh, before, then Jesus came, and then we're different afterwards. Titus chapter 3, verse 3 says, At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. He's not talking about somebody that's walking down the street right now who skipped out on church this morning. He's not talking about somebody who doesn't have a saving faith with Jesus Christ. He, no, he's talking about us, church. He's saying, once upon a time, you were that. You were disobedient. You were foolish. You were chasing after everything. But when the kindness and love of, our, of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things that we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through, Christ, through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Jesus did something amazing in us. He transformed us from those lists of of, of, of foolish and disobedient and those type of individuals into heirs to the kingdom of God, which lasts for all eternity. Did we earn it? No. He makes that clear. It's nothing that we did. It's when Jesus came. He did that for us. All believers should be striving to hold tight to that truth and the truth that surrounds it that we elevate Jesus above all the confusion outside. Leaders must encourage and rebuke <laughs> and the church with the gospel. We can't underplay it. We can't add to it. To the, there's Jesus plus all your good works. No. Right? That would discredit all of us because none of us could do enough good works to earn that favor. It has to be but God, but when Jesus appeared, when he came. All believers should be striving toward that end of making much of Jesus. If you're a church leader this morning, this church needs you to preach, to teach, to celebrate the gospel. If you're a church leader this morning, this church needs you to love and to live, to grow, and to grow them into disciple makers. We are all disciples who need to be sharing the gospel, but we can't let up on the truths that we cling so tightly to. So this morning, as we wind down, what should your leaders be like? Because the church's health is at stake, well, they need to be leaders who are blameless in the home, blameless in character, and blameless in their doctrine. They need to be Christian leaders. They need to be Christian disciples who are committed to making disciples. And because we believe in the priesthood of all believers and that all of us are called into ministry when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, and because, we, because the world in which we live and love uh, is, is destined for hell without that gospel, without that message, because we go to school every day or we go to work every day, because we go home every day, what does the world need this body of believers to be? It needs them to be blameless in their home, blameless in their doctrine, in their character, and blameless in their doctrine. 
your family, your church, your place of employment, your sports venues, your, your neighborhood, your community. The world needs you to be committed to holding and elevating truth, to living up, to, to living out your doctrine by the way that you live. Let's go back just a second to that quote that we read at the beginning from Demarest. He said, doctrine becomes deadly when it's divided from godly living. Truth must produce goodness or it's no truth at all. I want to throw something on top of that that comes from Richard Baxter, who a little known book called The Reformed Pastor. He, he says okay, to leaders, leaders, take heed of yourself, lest your example contradict your doctrine. Lest you unsay with your lives what you say with your tongues and be the greatest hinderer of the success of your own laborers. And back to that other commentary, that Christ-centered exposition. He says, it says there that the faithful leader, the faithful elder, must have no part in such contradiction. For the glory of God and the good of people, his life must match his belief. What he believes will connect with how he lives. Then he will be a leader worth trusting. Then he will be a leader worth following. And church, because we believe in that priesthood of all believers, because we believe that, that the, this letter of Titus and all of the New Testament uh, tells us that we are all pulled into ministry, because the world around us is for destined for hell if God doesn't intervene in their lives, let's look at this again. Leaders, listen through the microscope or look through the microscope. All of us look into the mirror. Tony Foreman, take heed of yourself, lest your example contradict your doctrine, lest you unsay with your life what you say with your tongue, and be the greatest hinderer at the success of your labors. Tony, a faithful Christian have, must have no part in such contradiction. For the glory of God and the good of the people, your life must match your belief. What you believe will connect with how you live. Then you will be a leader worth trusting. Then you will be a leader worth following. Church, when you look into the mirror, when you look into the microscope, do you see a person worth following? The true reality of it is it's you may be the only image of Jesus that somebody in, in your sphere of influence sees. So what version of Jesus are you showing them? How truly are you reflecting what we see in Scripture? When the characteristics of your life are magnified, how do they stand up? This morning, church, are you living a life blameless in the home? blameless in your character, blameless in your doctrine, that makes you an image bearer of Jesus worth following? What version, what reflection of Jesus are you sharing with the world in which you live and love?